Saturday, March 26th, 5.36 p.m. I'm going to read part one of chapter 16 of part three of book four of The Oath. Part one of chapter 16 precedes chapter 15 intentionally. The third operation in any magical ceremony is the oath or proclamation. The magician, armed and ready, stands in the center of the circle and strikes once upon the bell as if to call the attention of the universe. He then declares who he is, reciting his magical history by the proclamation of the grades which he has attained, giving the signs and words of those grades. This is not merely to prove himself a person in authority, it is to trace the chain of causes that have led to the present position, so that the operation is seen as karma. He then states the purpose of the ceremony, and proves that it is necessary to perform it and to succeed in its performance. He then takes an oath before the Lord of the universe, not before the particular Lord whom he is invoking, as if to call him to witness to the act. He swears solemnly that he will perform it, that nothing shall prevent him from performing it, that he will not leave the operation until it is successfully performed, and once again strikes upon the bell. Yet, having demonstrated himself in that position at once infinitely lofty and infinitely unimportant, the instrument of destiny, he balances this by the confession, in which there is again an infinite exaltation harmonized with an infinite humility. He admits himself to be a weak human being humbly aspiring to something higher, a creature of circumstance utterly dependent, even for the breath of life, upon a series of fortunate accidents. He makes this confession prostrate before the altar in agony and bloody sweat. Compare the remarks in a previous chapter, but this is a particular case. We leave its justification as a problem. He trembles at the thought of the operation which he has dared to undertake, saying, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Of course, this is for the beginner. As soon as it is assimilated as true, he will say, My will, which is thine, be done, and ultimately no more distinguish mine from thine. A sympathetic change of gesture will accompany the mental change. The dread answer comes that it must be, and this answer so fortifies him with holy zeal that it will seem to him as if he were raised by divine hands from that prostrate position. With a thrill of holy exaltation, he renews joyfully the oath, feeling himself once again no longer the man, but the magician, yet not merely the magician, but the chosen and appointed person to accomplish a task, which, however apparently unimportant, is yet an integral part of universal destiny, so that if it were not accomplished, the kingdom of heaven would be burst in pieces. He is now ready to commence the invocations. He consequently pauses to cast a last glance around the temple to assure himself of the perfect readiness of all things necessary, and to light the incense. The oath is the foundation of all work and magic, as it is an affirmation of the will. An oath binds the magician forever. In part two of this book, something has already been said on this subject, but its importance deserves some further elaboration. Thus, should one, loving a woman, make a spell to compel her embraces, and tiring of her a little later evoke Zazzle to kill her, he will find that the implications of his former oath conflict with those of his latter. He will be divided against himself, and therefore unable to invoke the unity of the godhead of Saturn. Zazel will refuse to obey him in the case of the woman whom he has sworn that he loves. To this, some may object that, since all acts are magical, every man who loves a woman implicitly takes an oath of love and therefore would never be able to murder her later, as we find to be the not uncommon case. The explanation is as follows. It is perfectly true that when Bill Sykes desires to possess Nancy, he does in fact evoke a spirit of the nature of Venus, constraining him by his oath of love and by his magical power as a man to bring him the girl. So also when he wants to kill her, he evokes a martial or Saturnian spirit with an oath of hate. But these are not purely planetary spirits, moving in well-defined spheres by rigidly righteous laws. They are gross concretions of confused impulses, incapable of understanding the nature of an oath. They are also such that the idea of murder is no wise offensive to the spirit of love. There is also the question of identity of the two impulses, implied in much classical poetry, half stated by Schopenhauer, 
and declared openly and with much grotesque distortion by Freud and his school. The biologists also discovered this fact and were much clearer and more exact. It is indeed the criterion of spiritual caste that conflicting elements should not coexist in the same consciousness. The psalm-singing Puritan who persecutes publicans and secretly soaks himself in firewater, the bewhiskered philanthropist in broadcloth who swindles his customers and sweats his employees, these men must not be regarded as simple-minded scoundrels, whose use of religion and respectability to cloak their villainies is a deliberate disguise dictated by their criminal cunning. Far from it. They are only too sincere in their virtues. Their terror of death and of supernatural vengeance is genuine. It proceeds from a section of themselves which is in irreconcilable conflict with their rascality. Neither side can conciliate, suppress, or ignore the other yet each is so craven as to endure its enemy's presence. Such men are therefore without pure principles. They excuse themselves for every dirty trick that turns to their apparent advantage. The first step of the aspirant towards the gate of initiation tells him that purity, unity of purpose, is essential above all else. Do what thou wilt strikes on him a ray of fierce white flame consuming all that is not utterly God. Very soon he is aware that he cannot consciously contradict himself. He develops a subtle sense which warns him that two trains of thought which he never conceived as connected are incompatible. Yet deeper drives do what thou wilt. Subconscious oppositions are evoked to visible appearance. The secret sanctuaries of the soul are cleansed. Do what thou wilt purges his every part. He has become one, one only. His will is consequently released from the interference of internal opposition, and he is a master of magic. But for that very reason, he is now utterly impotent to achieve anything that is not in absolute accordance with his original oath, with his true will, by virtue whereof he incarnated as a man. With Bill Sykes, love and murder are not mutually exclusive, as they are with King Arthur. The higher type of man, the more sensitive he becomes, so that the noblest love divines intuitively when a careless word or gesture may wound, and vigilant shuns them as being of the family of murder. In magic, likewise, the adept who has sworn to attain the knowledge and conversation of his holy guardian angel may in his grosser days have been expert as a healer to find out that he is now incapable of any such work. He will probably be puzzled and wonder whether he has lost all his power, yet the cause may be no more than that the wisdom of his angel deprecates the interference of ignorant kindliness with diseases which may have been sent to the sufferer for a purpose profoundly important to his welfare. I don't like the tone of this, Better to put it that the true will of the patient may find these apparent handicaps essentially helpful, and that all interference is dangerous, especially as the full consequences of any action are unknowable. In the case of the Master Therion, he had originally the capacity for all classes of orgia, Latin orgies or secret rites. In Crowley's usage, it also connotes magical operations generally. In the beginning, he cured the sick, bewitched the obstinate, allured the seductive, routed the aggressive, made himself invisible, and generally behaved like a young man about town on every possible plane. He would afflict one vampire with a sending of cats, and appoint another his private enchantress, neither aware of any moral oxymoron, nor hampered by the implicit incongruity of his oaths. But as he advanced in adeptship, this cultishness found its mouth bitted. As soon as he took serious oaths, and was admitted to the order which we name not, those oaths prevented him from using his powers as playthings. Trifling operations, such as he could once do with the turn of a wrist, became impossible to the most persistent endeavor. It was many years before he understood the cause of this, but little by little he became so absorbed in the work of his true will that it no longer occurred to him to indulge in capricious amusements. See Liber 633, De Thaumaturgia. Yet, even at this hour, though he be verily a magus of A.A., Though his word be the word of the eon, though he be the beast, 666, the lord of the scarlet woman, in whom is all power given, there are still certain orgia beyond him to perform, because to do so would be to affirm what he hath denied in those oaths, by whose virtue he is that he is. This is the case, even when the spirit of such orgia is fully consonant with his will. The literal sense of his original oath insists that it shall be respected. The case offers two instances of this principle. Frater Pertorabo specifically swore that he would renounce his personal possessions to the last penny, also that he would allow no human affection to hinder him. These terms were accepted, 
He was granted infinitely more than he had imagined possible to an incarnated man. On the other hand, the price offered by him was exactly as strictly as if it had been stipulated by Shylock. Every treasure that he had on earth was taken away, and that, usually, in so brutal or cruel a manner as to make the loss itself the least part of the pang. Every human affection that he hid in his heart, and that heart aches for love as few hearts can ever conceive, was torn out and trampled with such infernal ingenuity and intensifying torture that his endurance is beyond belief. Inexplicable are the atrocities which accompanied every step in his initiation. Death dragged away his children with slow savagery. The women he loved drank themselves into delirium and dementia before his eyes, or repaid his passionate devotion with toad-cold treachery at the moment when long years of loyalty had tempted him to trust them. His friend that bore the bag stole that which was put therein, and betrayed his master as thoroughly as he was able. At the first distant rumor that the Pharisees were out, his disciples all forsook him and fled. His mother nailed him with her own hands to the cross, and reviled him as nine years he hung thereupon. Now, having endured to the end, being master of magic, he is mighty to work his true will, which will is to establish on earth his word, the law of Thelema. He hath none other will than this, so all that he doth is unto this end. All his orgia bear fruit. What was the work of a month when he was a full major adept is today wrought in a few minutes by the words of will, uttered with the right vibrations into the prepared ear. But neither by the natural use of his abilities, though they have made him famous throughout the whole world, nor by the utmost might of his magic, is he able to acquire material wealth beyond the minimum necessary to keep him alive and at work. It is in vain that he protests that not he but the work is in need of money. He is barred by the strict letter of his oath to give all that he hath for his magical attainment. Yet more awful is the doom that he hath invoked upon himself in renouncing his right as a man to enjoy the love of those whom he loves with passion so selfless, so pure, and so intense in return for the power so to love mankind that he be chosen to utter the word of the eon for their sake his reward universal abhorrence, bodily torment, mental despair, and moral paralysis. Yet he who hath power over death, with a breath can call back health, with a touch to beckon life. He must watch his own child waste away month by month, aware that his art may not any wise avail, who hath sold the signet ring of his personal profit to buy him a plain gold band for the felon finger of his bride, that worn widow the world. 